Second, we seek to infuse diversity and inclusion perspectives into our workplace as part of our culture. Diverse voices can be a catalyst for increasing data quality and data relevance, as well as advancing equity. It promotes innovation and excellence. I've actually spoken about this for the last couple of years as uh, in my role at, uh, in my previous employment at uh, American Statistical Association as president, and I've written about it in my director's log, which are, you're welcome to view if, you, if you're curious. Uh, third, we will engage with and actively listen to the full diversity of our stakeholders, which includes you, of course. Stakeholder feedback is critical to understanding the needs of our data users. Now, scientific integrity is also essential uh, to our pursuit of excellence. We continue to be transparent about the quality and reliability of the statistics we publish and the data we release. As you know, all statistical products are subject to various sources of error. So data consumers are best served when they're apprised of the strengths and limitations. Naturally, we're also committed to leveraging technology and rethinking our entire data enterprise at the Census Bureau, not just for decennial census, but in all the different data collections uh, and processing that we do. In, and we look to do that in new and different ways over the coming decade and in preparation for 2030. We'll be seeking your feedback on these plans and activities in the near future. But today is devoted to a briefing on differential privacy, and I don't want to take up too much time, so let me stop here so that we can then proceed to our agenda. But one quick note, um, I do look forward to seeing you in our May meeting. Um, and today I need to step out just for a little while, around 3.20, uh, for a, a meeting with the senator, but I'll be right back as soon as I can and uh, re-engage with you. So that's it. And uh, what's next, Karen? Well, Director Santos, I believe we have a few minutes for uh, just very briefly for a question and answer session. Uh, James Tucker, if you'd like to moderate that. Absolutely. And so I don't see any questions the chat right now are have any questions from while we're doing that I will just offer one to the director um, thank you so much director Sam, for the opening remarks we really appreciate that um, could you describe I, I know one of the big issues that we've been looking at and we certainly did it um, we've looked at it in terms of the messaging uh, is the executive order regarding uh, equity and, and inclusion can you describe some of the efforts that you're going to be undertaking to uh, apply that executive order to the Census Bureau's operation? Uh, certainly. Well, uh, you, you'll note that I came in rather uh, like after a period of time uh, from when the executive order was released. And so, um, to my delight, there's a variety of activity that's already going on. I talked about the equity uh, the data equity work group, that's one effort. Uh, there is a uh, diversity council that meets with uh, employees to develop, uh, to capture input on what's working, what's not working. And I'm looking to work with leadership to um, advance a, an equity um, task force to look at our practices um, and policies uh, to make sure that we do a couple of things, the first of which is to gather different perspectives uh, from things like uh, are we collecting the, the most accurate data? How can we improve it? Uh, are we being culturally sensitive in how we uh, extend to our, um, to, to our participants in surveys and censuses? Um, are we providing the types of data that can be useful to the, the rich diversity of the, the stakeholder community and the policy community out there. So uh, we're doing that type of, uh, we're in the planning stages and actively there have been, there's been some work in that regard as well. Um, and we're also doing a review of, of things like, you know, what, what does our staff look like uh, in terms of uh, ethnic racial diversity, in terms of area diversity and expertise, um, RP, uh, what types of opportunities are folks being provided 
to, to grow and nurture uh, and, and develop into career professionals. Uh, so we're looking for those types of areas of um, creating opportunity and equity, as well as, like I said, bringing in this, uh, an expanded view of, of pretty much things that sometimes we took for granted, but, but if you look at them from a different angle, you can actually say, hey, maybe we can be doing better, and, and here's a direction for research. So that's the type of stuff we're doing. Fantastic. I'm still looking, and I don't see any hands up. Uh, please don't raise your hand. Um, it's a great opportunity to get in the queue and to ask uh, Dr. Santos questions. While, again, hey, James, I'm waiting. Hi, James. It's Shauna Banks. You might be having a small issue with the hand raise, so if your team wants to put in the, the panelist chat that they have a question, that'll work too. Okay, fantastic. Uh, so, yes, Thank please you. identify. In, in the chat, if you, um, if you have any questions, um, and again, while we're waiting for that, I'm going to ask one more question uh, with the expectation should have some questions to follow from other NAC members, and that is, uh, given the role of the, the National Advisory Committee and the fact that we focus particularly on historically undercounted populations, um, what role do you see in, in your role as director? How can we support you in trying to improve the, um, both the outreach and the accuracy that count of those historically targeted Well, actually, uh, I'm glad you asked that because there, uh, there are a couple of ways. One is simply to keep doing the great work that you're doing. Uh, I uh, commit to being at these meetings, listening, uh, and uh, taking in all of the feedback that you have so that I can go back to the, the career staff at the Census Bureau and the leadership to say, here are the types of, in, uh, of issues that are of importance, and here are the recommendations that we should really be thinking about. That's kind of like part of like, you know, we're doing the same type of stuff. The, the other piece, which um, uh, I'm not too sure if this would be too much of a burden, would be to uh, ask the NAC to, um, to do a little bit of outreach on their own to uh, see if there are other stakeholder communities related to your own particular interests that could provide you with feedback in the process of you being an ACT member and then coming uh, to, to uh, the Census Bureau uh, to provide uh, our dialogue and, and discourse and, and for you to create your recommendations. So doing a little bit of like NAC outreach, member outreach to their, your your own constituencies and uh, fellow stakeholders would be would be beneficial. Uh, the third is that, and I've seen evidence of this, so I'm not gonna, I'm not going to confess that this is new, but it's really important, and that is to make sure that you provide us with things that you want to talk about and address at these NAC meetings, because I believe that there needs to be a two-way street in our partnership. Uh, advisory partnership, which is we have things that we really need your input on, but you have interests and you see things that maybe we don't that you need to come to us so that we can put on the agenda uh, and so we can have some discourse. Fantastic. And again, I still don't see any heads. This is really unusual, but I will say that one thing that has been... It's a succinct statement. I mean, it's a succinct statement. How's that done? <laughs> the, um, one, uh, one thing I think that's been pretty consistent, a pretty consistent thing for the NAC members is that whether we begin in May or we begin later this year, there's certainly a lot of interest in revisiting, updating the 1997 OMB race and ethnicity standards and specifically reopening the conversation on uh, Middle Eastern, North African category and really robustly um, taking up the topic of a sexual orientation and gender identity question. Uh, because those are those are certainly issues that are um, very important to the communities that the NAC members represent. And um, certainly that was a lot of the feedback that we had gotten from the 2020 census data products that have come out so far, is that there are still um, historically um, undercounted communities that feel like they are not necessarily recognized on the census surveys themselves. So I was wondering perhaps if you could comment on that. And then we will open it up one last time to see if there are any NAC members with questions. And if not, we will move on to our, again, very robust um, agenda. Very good. Uh, I totally hear you on 
the desire to um, to uh, incorporate uh, the MENA categories uh, and to uh, consider uh, SOGI questions. Uh, it's uh, really up to OMB to, to make those standards, but we're not going to sit back, basically, and wait, you know, for something to happen. We're going to be engaged with OMB. I believe that as soon as the, the um, chief statistician is announced, if a, I'm hoping that it's soon, um, we will then begin to actively engage and come together to work uh, under the guidance of OMB to see how we can come to terms with some of these really, really important issues. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm there with you. Okay, thank you for that. And uh, okay, we have a question from uh, Thomas Sands. Please. Thanks, Jim. Uh, Director Santos, uh, we're having an important discussion today, of course, about a, a new disclosure avoidance system put in place by the Bureau uh, this issue that you just discussed uh, about a potential change to race and ethnicity questions is obviously very significant. There are significant uh, repercussions from what occurred in 2020. All of this has a lot to do with public communications, of course. Um, and it seems that the public communications is often under-resourced at the Bureau, except when we get close to needing to do the outreach for the decennial census. So my question is that, what, what can be done to augment the Bureau's public communications resources in light of all the momentous occurrences uh, we are experiencing today and may experience if OMB does take up the issue we just discussed? Uh, well, the, the, uh, I, will, I will answer that question directly, uh, but I will first say that I have been a witness uh, to the value that uh, bolstering a communications capacity in an organization can have when you pretty much essentially change nothing else, but you bolster the communications and find ways to tailor messaging to specific stakeholders that are, that are interested in particular messages or topics. So you can take, you know, you can do the best research, but if it doesn't get out to the people that can use it, you almost may as well not have done it in the first place. So I'm a huge believer that communication matters. And uh, so I uh, envision as part of moving forward that um, I, will, I will be giving serious consideration to how to, uh, to bolster and, and grow our communications capacity so that we can uh, do some uh, messaging in a way that's more timely, more relevant. Um, and uh, that includes communications as being sort of external viewing that, in, that includes the, our census website, for example, mm -hmm. and accessing data and such. I okay, see so we have about two minutes left. We've got time for one more question. I will give 10 seconds for someone to indicate in the chat a question. If not, I will ask one last question. Uh, any, I, I'm going to, and again, by the way, I, I wish I could take credit for these questions. These are questions NAC members have, have asked. Um, and so the last one actually um, involves the outreach program of the Office of Strategic Alliances. I just want to kind of comment on it that we're very pleased to see it, and perhaps if you could just speak briefly on the additional resources that you anticipate being committed to that effort to improve the outreach of the Census Bureau for all of its um, census surveys, not just the decennial. Yeah, I, uh, we're looking to establish sort of an enterprise approach uh, to outreach so that we can have, uh, the, we've used the word uh, evergreen, but, but a continuous flow of information back and forth from st to stakeholders and from stakeholders on our current ongoing activities, on questions where we need input, on reactions to plans, and so forth. Uh, so we see this group as being key to, uh, to managing that effort and expanding the effort uh, to not only create a more continuous 
uh, interactions with the existing, our existing stakeholders, but to expand, expand and find others uh, who can provide valuable input. Thank you so much, Mark Santos. And Aaron, I know seconds left, so we are right on time. I will turn it back over to you. All right, thank you, James. Thank you, Director Santos. So now, uh, please welcome Jason Devine, Nicholas Jones, Michael Hawes, and Cynthia Hollingsworth, who will provide a response to the MAC Fall 2021 recommendations on differential privacy, followed by committee discussion. Thank you, Karen. Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So on the screen, we're going to have recommendations from the NAC Fall 2021 meeting, and our subject matter experts from the Census Bureau will provide some context and some responses to those recommendations. Uh, we'll step through these with Cynthia Davis Hollingsworth, with Jason Devine, and also with Michael Hawes. So we're going to jump right into it and start with recommendation one, which is shown on the screen. The recommendation was that the NAC recommends the Census Bureau report to the NAC on the lessons learned of its stakeholder engagement and tribal consultations on the application of the Disclosure Avoidance System, or the DAS, and differential privacy to the PL94171 redistricting data and report to the NAC on its findings before February 1st, 2022. For this recommendation, Jason Devine is gonna provide some context and also address the related component pieces of the recommendation that are shown on the slide. Jason? Good afternoon, and thank you, Nicholas. I'm Jason Devine. So the Census Bureau is, is working to respond to this recommendation, but was unable to report completely on its findings by the February date provided. We are looking forward to sharing more about our stakeholder engagement and how the comments we received are informing decisions about the Disclosure Avoidance System or the DAS, specifically what tables to include in the DHC. At this time, we don't, do not have a written summary or report that would provide an accounting of the comments we received but that report would also address the sub-recommendations that were made as part of, of this recommendation. Uh, and we're also continuing to try to find a way forward for making the comments that we received from our most recent solicitation for feedback available to the public. And I'll, I'll now go through the sub-recommendations and say a little bit about each of them. First sub-recommendation was the extent to which the Census Bureau's Federal Register notices about DAS and differential privacy resulted in stakeholder feedback desired by the Bureau. So we had two solicitations for feedback. The first were in prior to the Census. The second was a solicitation for feedback at the end of last year. The feedback from the earlier FRN helped inform the initial design of the 2020 data products, mainly the DHC, that's the Demographic and Housing Characteristics file, and the detailed demographic and housing characteristics file. And the second call for feedback has helped inform decisions about the final design of the DHC and the potential addition of tables to that product. And of course, feedback throughout has influenced decisions about accuracy and has helped us identify areas where improvements to our methodology were needed. And the Census Bureau will report more on this at a later date as part of the summary uh, that I mentioned before. The second Sub-recommendation, the extent to which the use of jargon and technical terms impeded communication to stakeholders, data users, and the public about the DAS and privacy measures being implemented by the Bureau. The Census Bureau appreciates the extended conversations we've had with stakeholders in recent months about the ways in which it can improve communications around topics related to disclosure avoidance and privacy. Well, we've made significant progress in the outreach uh, we conduct around this topic via regular webinars, newsletters, and other stakeholder and data user engagement. We continue to refine the ways in which we communicate around this subject. We're committed to balancing accurate reflections of technical and statistical information and readability. And we appreciate stakeholders and data users' patience and diligence in working with us to identify and improve specific points of confusion and to refine our messaging, um, a process which continues even today as we speak to you. The next, next one was the effectiveness, objectivity, and accuracy of press reporting on the Census Bureau's efforts to implement the DAS and privacy measures to the 2020 Census. The Census Bureau regularly works with the media to educate reporters on our work and answer their questions. 
but we don't have a role in determining the content or ensuring the objectivity of any reports, but we do point out inaccuracies when they are present. Next, the extent to which all the Census Bureau's outreach accurately identified all known priority use cases. Our out outreach prompted many stakeholders, data users, and members of the public to provide use cases. However, even after our, our outreach, we doubt it will, we will have accurately identified all use cases. We will, however, report out on the use cases that we did identify from the feedback. And the next recommendation, the impact that the timing of decisions on the DAS and differential privacy had on the range of consultation and stakeholder engagement the Census Bureau would have preferred to do. It was difficult for us to know how the timing of work on the DAS impacted our outreach and engagement with stakeholders. We do know that our outreach started early, as early as 2018, but that outreach has improved over time as we and the public have learned more about this effort to modernize the Census Bureau's disclosure avoidance methods. And the final sub-recommendation, what, le what lessons learned are from the Census Bureau's outreach and consultations and how those lessons learned can be applied to future stakeholder engagement, including to the DHC files. We're already applying lessons learned from initial 2020 Census disclosure avoidance conversations to the strategy of public data users and stakeholders around the demographic and housing characteristics file and the detailed demographic and housing characteristics files. This, like we do with lessons learned from other operations, is something we'll be documenting uh, for future efforts. That covers recommendation one. Um, as I mentioned, we will be working uh, over the longer term to provide more in-depth report covering some of the items, uh, recommendations that you made to us, um, and be happy to discuss this more as we uh, finish going through the other recommendations today. Thank you. I'll now give it back to Nicholas to go over recommendation number two. Thank you, Jason. So if we could please move to the next slide. Hopefully everyone's seeing that on their screen. Here we have recommend recommendation two. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau apply DAS and differential privacy to the DHC and the detailed DHC in a matter that allows for accurate data on smaller populations, including at the sub-county level and the tribal area level. Michael Hawes will address this recommendation for us. Michael? Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, I'm Michael Hawes. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so one of the major advantages of differentially private disclosure avoidance methods generally and of the 2020 DAS in particular uh, is the ability to tune the infusion of noise that's necessary to protect confidentiality in very particular and precise ways to ensure fitness for use of the resulting data for important use cases. Uh, the tuning that we've already done and that we will continue to be doing over the coming months uh, is the product of extensive feedback that we've already received from our stakeholders uh, and that we anticipate receiving in conjunction with the forthcoming demonstration data products. Uh, there are, however, a number of decisions that have to be made regarding this tuning, uh, and those decisions will be made over the coming months by the Census Bureau's Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, or DSEP. Uh, DSEP's decision-making will be informed by the internal and external feedback and analysis that we've performed and received, uh, and by our obligations to protect the confidentiality of respondent data under Title 13. I'll pass it back to Nicholas to go to the third recommendation. Great. Thank you, Michael. And so the next recommendation, number three on the screen, advises that the Census Bureau explain the impact of decoupling the redistricting file and the DHC file for the goal of making the 2020 Census data more accurate. And Michael is also going to address this recommendation. Great. Thanks, Nicholas. So the, the operational delays of the 2020 census resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic uh, required us to make a number of schedule changes to get critical census data out as quickly as possible. Uh, one of those changes was the decoupling of disclosure avoidance plan for the Public Law 94-171 redistricting data summary file uh, and for the demographic and housing characteristics file. Uh, initially, uh, we were intending to, to run both of those sets of data through the DAS at the same time. Uh, but this decoupling allowed us to initially focus on tuning the redistricting data uh, to ensure fitness for use for the redistricting and Voting Rights Act use cases in the most expeditious way possible. 
Uh, this decoupling, however, also allowed us to be more deliberate and iterative with our tuning of the DHC. Uh, and it's allowed us to produce additional demonstration data products uh, for our data users to evaluate. Uh, ultimately, this decoupling is allowing us the opportunity to better ensure that the resulting DHC data uh, will meet our data users' needs. Back to you, Nicholas. Thank you, Michael. So next we'll turn to recommendation four, which Cynthia Hollingsworth will address. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau report on outreach to other federal agencies to include the input the Bureau received from federal agencies on the use of census data in funding formulas for federal programs, and the guidance that the Census Bureau provides to those agencies on limitations and uses of that data, including limitations due to data quality issues. Cynthia? Thank you, Nicholas. So as you're aware, we've been educating our stakeholders and data users every step of the way around what DP is and why we've adopted it, as well as how the implementation of the DAS's top-down algorithm will work. We presented at several meetings, lots of conferences and meetings. Uh, we've released blogs, newsletters, technical papers, a user-friendly introduction to disclosure avoidance. We call that the handbook, as well as conducted various webinars on the DP implementation. In those meetings and discussions that we've had with the various stakeholder groups, and there are many stakeholder groups for which we have been having these discussions, such as uh, this group here, um, also to include the American Indian and Alaska Native Tribal Leaders, the National Congress of American Indians, also with the CNSTAT or Committee of National Statistics, our um, groups such as the state data centers and the Census Information Center networks, civil rights groups, congressional committees and staff, professional associations, academic partners and researchers, as well as the federal agency partners. So with this, as Jason mentioned earlier, we do plan to produce a summary of these outreach efforts that include the use cases, and that's both use cases where we were soliciting feedback on the crosswalk itself, the table structure, as well as feedback on the data's fitness for use once we produce demonstration data. And it's important to produce that demonstration data and detailed summary metrics to allow the data user community to uh, have their independent assessments on the data's fitness for use. So these activities are ongoing, and so while we plan to produce a summary, as we continue releasing the demonstration data, that will help feed the summary of information that we would share with the federal partners. Thank you, Nicholas. Okay, hey, thank you, Cynthia. So on the bottom of the screen, we have recommendation number five. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau create a catalog of all federal or state statutory or regulatory required uses of data from the DHC and or the detailed DHC and consider that catalog, in addition to feedback solicited from stakeholders, as it completes its decision-making with the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee, or DCEP, on the application of the DAS to the DHC and the detailed DHC. Jason, we're gonna turn back to you for this recommendation discussion. Thank you again, Nicholas. The Census Bureau agrees that collecting, curating, and synthesizing a comprehensive set of Data use cases for census data assist decision-making regarding the census, and the Census Bureau will work to build a repository of use cases for the comments we have received and looks forward to updating the committee on our progress. Even without a repository of use cases, our decisions are still benefiting from the review of the comments that we've already conducted. As we have made the comments available to subject matter experts for each topic in a sort of easy-to-use format so they can review those and incorporate the feedback that we received that's directly related to the topics they work on and incorporate that into their decisions and recommendations they make back to us as we're um, determining the final design of the DHC. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. As we move to the final slide, we'll cover recommendation number six first. And here the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau engage in discussion and dialogue with appropriate congressional leadership 
on the new DAS for 2020 Census to include A, the impact of private third-party big data on Census disclosure avoidance, and the Bureau's Title 13 confidentiality protection obligations. B, any differences in the privacy value or confidentiality protection imperative with respect to different census collected data points, such as race, sex, age, et cetera, and C, recommendations to modify any statutory mandated uses of DHC or detailed DHC data or any statutory mandated data releases in response to the new DAS for Census 2020. With this recommendation, we're gonna turn back to Michael Hollis. Michael? Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, so the Census Bureau regularly briefs key congressional stakeholders, uh, members of Congresses and senators, uh, offices, their staffs, uh, committees, and so on. Uh, and we have had and will continue to have dedicated conversations uh, around the 2020 Census Disclosure Avoidance System uh, as, as they are requested or as they are deemed necessary. Uh, back to you, Nicholas. All right, thanks, Michael. We have one more for you. The next recommendation on the screen, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau revisit its decision to ensure data consistency between PL 94171 and the DHC data releases to determine if abandonment of that decision would appreciably increase the accuracy of DHC data release. Michael? So this, this is an issue that the Census Bureau has extensively evaluated. Uh, we have consulted with our stakeholders on the possible impacts and consequences of this decision. Uh, we've also engaged the, the Jason expert group to evaluate this question, and their final report made a number of findings and recommendations to help inform DCEP's decision-making on this question. Uh, as you will see in the upcoming demonstration data, uh, we have been able to tune the DAS for the production of the demographic and housing characteristics file in a way that meets fitness for use targets uh, while also ensuring full consistency between the DHC uh, and the PL94171 redistricting data summary file. So uh, um, you will be able to evaluate that uh, once the demonstration data come out, but uh, we're appreciative of all the feedback that we received to help us make these decisions. Back to you, Nicholas. Great, thank you, Michael, and thank you, Jason. So we'll turn to Cynthia for the final two recommendations, and we'll read these out uh, one by one. Recommendation number eight. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau evaluate its education and public engagement efforts on DAS and its application to the PL94171 release with respect to three different audiences, A, stakeholders and data users, B, members of Congress and other policymakers, and C, the general public, and that the Census Bureau report on its evaluation to NAC, including how its evaluation has altered plans with respect to education and or engagement on the DAS in application to the DHC and the detailed DHC. Cynthia? Thank you, Nicholas. Yes, we appreciate that recommendation and we wholeheartedly are evaluating how we went about with our engagement campaign on the redistricting data release. I will tell you that we've certainly learned three major points that I, I tend to articulate um, as we are giving uh, initial feedback on lessons learned from the redistricting data. Um, one of those major points, of course, is on the education and teaching. So it's how we present to the stakeholder community um, and how we educate the data users on, again, what DP is, why we've adopted it, and how we implement it particularly for the redistricting, but along down the line on any other data product. There's also the aspect of the learning piece, and that is for us within the Census Bureau and the agency, where we have these sort of listening sessions where we're trying to gather from the stakeholder community how they use the data and for what purpose, because that helps us with the DAS implementation. And then lastly, as everyone is very much aware, we show or demonstrate how we might in implement the DAS by using that on the 2010 data 
in addition to releasing summary metrics to allow the general public to conduct their independent assessments uh, for fitness for use. And so as we've learned from that, we've continued to implement the same process um, for the DHC, um, as well as we look and ask for additional feedback in our communication strategy, which is, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later on the, the task mm -hmm. four. I'll pass it back to Nicholas. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. So we have one more recommendation to address. Recommendation number nine. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau produce a timeline and plan for the timely release of detailed DHC data for detailed racial and ethnic population groups in order to enable compliance with health and safety obligations of stakeholders, especially in light of decisions made with respect to 2020 ACS data. The plan for timely and accurate detailed DHC data should include proactive outreach to stakeholders and sufficient time for stakeholders to provide feedback on priority tables and delivery formats. So we'll again turn to Cynthia to discuss this recommendation. Thank you, Nicholas. Uh, we appreciate this recommendation as well, and I am happy to say um, that we are working on our data release plan, not only for the detailed DHC, but also for the demographic and housing characteristics file, or the DHC. So we, re we released a newsletter last week announcing that we plan to release the demonstration data for the DHC on March 16th. As we've promised in the past, we will allow a public comment period for feedback. So as we continue to develop our schedule for both DHC demonstration data as well as the actual production 2020 data release, we are also working on a timeline schedule for the detailed DHC. And we recognize that this is important for planning purposes as well as understanding when will the public have an opportunity to give feedback. So with this timeline that we're developing for both DHC and detailed DHC, we'll also include milestone dates for when you could expect to, re to see demonstration data, when the public comment period, how long that will be. We've, we've often said we would allow a minimum of 30 calendar days for a feedback uh, period, and we stand by that. We are doing our very best to ensure we allow the public adequate time to give feedback. And then we also plan within this um, data product release schedule, not only for feedback, but also planned release dates. And that, again, it's not just for detailed DHC, but it would also be for DHC. And we are feverishly working on this schedule, and it is our goal to have this schedule disseminated to the public by the end of this month, March of 2022. Thank you. Thank you, Cynthia. Thank you also to Jason and to Michael for helping to address the NAC recommendations. And uh, we thank the NAC and we look forward to working with you along with our colleagues through a number of NAC and CSAC differential privacy working group meetings uh, throughout this year. So thank you again for your work and your collaboration with us. All right, thank you for your uh, response to the recommendation. Uh, as we turn the committee discussion over to James Tucker, I would just like to remind uh, the NAC members to please be sure to identify yourself uh, prior to making a comment or asking a question. So James Tucker, please take it away for the committee discussion. Thank you, Karen. And I want to just get started by thanking Jason, Michael, Cynthia, for very detailed responses to those questions. We appreciate it. Um, I don't see any questions chat yet. I just want to remind folks that because the raise hand feature is not working by your question, we would like to ask a question in the chat. In the meantime, I'm going to uh, if I want to do to ask the first question. Um, we understand that the demonstration data for the DHC uh, products will be released this month. Do you, have, do you happen to have a date for that yet? Um, we understand the schedule will still be worked out, but if we could know the projected release date, the first set of demonstrations, that would be very helpful. This is Cynthia Hollingsworth. So the release date for the first part of the DHC demonstration data is March 
16th. Thank you so much. And again, I want to remind folks there have to be questions. <laughs> um, usually you're not this silent. Um, please put that question in the chat or if you're having technical problems, um, just feel free to, to unmute yourself and ask a question. Uh, I'm just going to pause for a few seconds. I'm not seeing any, but I actually, um, I want to thank all of you for a very uh, detailed uh, response. I, um, if you don't mind, Karen, I think we can just go straight into the discussion presentations. Oh, never mind. I, um, Thomas Sands does have a question, and then we will go into the discussion presentations. Thanks, Jim, and, and thank you uh, to all of the presenters. So, so my question, uh, I think, goes to the issue of a congressional consultation, which I appreciate the answer. But I'm sort of grappling with the, the myriad of federal statutes that incorporate some form of census data, never the same, uh, different uh, data points in their funding formulas and wondering whether the Bureau is directly grappling with those specific federal formulas and, and or advising in its course of its congressional consultation where perhaps some modification of those formulas might be advisable uh, given how the data may be suppressed or may be changed as a result of DP and, and the new disclosure avoidance system. Um, I, I hope that's clear. Uh, so this is Michael Hawes. I can, I can start with a response to that. Um, so this is a, a tricky issue because, I mean, census data are used for, for numerous critically important federal programs. Um, but we can't tell agencies how to use our data or how to adapt their own programs to use our data. Um, what we can do and what we have been doing and will absolutely be doing um, with the, the demonstration data and then with the release of the actual files is educate our federal partners on what the, the strengths and limitations of the data are. And we've done that with all of our data products over the years. Um, that's always a challenge uh, in many respects. And um, educating our federal partners on those limitations uh, is not always successful. Um, but it's something that, that we certainly endeavor to do, and uh, we will be working with our federal partners, particularly as the demonstration data come out, uh, and then again uh, with the actual data products when they're released to, to help inform them of what the impacts of, of the 2020 disclosure avoidance system might be on their uses of these data. Thank you. If I could just ask you a quick follow, up, Michael. So I, I, what I hear you saying is, and I appreciate it, is that out of respect for other agencies, you essentially you go to them, and if they decide based on your advice or otherwise that they maybe should go to Congress and say you might want to modify your funding formula as stated in X statute, that you're sort of forced to follow that indirect route rather than directly saying to Congress members, hey, you know, there's a funding formula in statute X. And we think you might want to look at it, at revising it. But, but it sounds like you're sort of forced by comity between agencies to sort of go through the agencies first and have them determine if they think they should go to Congress about any potential change. Is that fair? I think that's a fair assessment. I mean, other agencies uh, don't tell us how to conduct censuses and surveys, and, and we don't tell other agencies how to run their programs. Um, we can tell them about the data that they're using and what the, as I said, what the strengths and limitations of those data are. Uh, and if upon receiving that information, they decide that changes to their programs are necessary, it would be, it would be up to them as the experts on those programs uh, to identify what changes might need to be made. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. And I'm just going to make one quick last call for questions for the presentation. If not, um, I'll pause for about 10 seconds. We will take our break about 10 seconds. Hi, James. It's Shauna Banks. We're having a little bit of breakup on your microphone. Sir. Okay. 
Um, I think it was your last call for questions. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And I haven't seen any. I haven't seen any in the chat. So it looks like at this time we can turn it back over to Karen to take our 10-minute break, just a few minutes early. Okay, thank you all very much. So we will start our break and we will come back at uh, 340. Welcome back, everyone, and thank you for standing by. I'd now like to pass the call back to Karen Battle. Thank you so much. You may begin. Okay, everybody, welcome back to the NAC special session on differential privacy. Uh, as a reminder, information for closed captioning services can be found on the NAC website. Uh, we will now hear from Julio Guiti Guevara, John Sandoval, and Carol Hafford, who will present the working group task for deliverables. And I do want to just give a special alert to the presenters that if we have not completed our discussion by 410, that we will pause the discussion for public comments and then resume the discussion. So please go right ahead. Hi, it's Shonda Banks. You're maybe on mute. Hello. I can hear you. Thank you. Saludos a todos. Uh, greetings, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Tony and Karen. Uh, I also want to thank uh, Jason, Nicholas, Cynthia, and Michael for their most recent response to the recommendation. And uh, this is a very important issue for, for not only for the Census Bureau, but for all of us, data users, field right organizations, organizations that represent a small population. Uh, my colleague, uh, John Sandoval, and I uh, will spend about six minutes each, maybe less, uh, just to tell you a little bit about some due diligence activities that we conducted uh, with regard to uh, messaging and uh, communicating differential privacy to the general public. As a result, we identify uh, three areas of communication that should be taken into account, and they included a communication with regard to the process, communication with regard to the legal requirements, and communication about a stakeholders' engagement. Uh, there are some questions that uh, my uh, colleague, uh, John Sandoval, will address, but a, a significant part of our due diligence was around the questions of a, how does the Census Bureau decided to use this, this differential privacy? A, how does the Census Bureau will apply differential privacy? What, are the, what is the relationship between the application of differential privacy and the different undercount a, differential undercount on race and ethnic uh, population. And then uh, we also uh, went over uh, an interpretation, a general interpretation of the uh, Title 13 of the United States Code. So again, uh, these three questions respond to the issue of, of, of process, legal requirements, and a, a stakeholder engagement. Uh, we 
after uh, looking at Title 13, uh, we uh, have to uh, uh, let everybody know that we, we found out that for decades, the Bureau has not released data from a small geographic unit that may be used to identify individuals, particularly those small racial and ethnic minorities. Now, for 2020, whether injecting noise to make it harder to cross-reference census data products to apply differential privacy is the question that has a significant or will have a significant impact in our community. And uh, with that, I will, I will give the, the mic to, to my colleague, uh, John. Thank you very much, Julio. Uh, Tony, could you please advance the slide? One more. Thank you. So the Census Bureau has proactively shared information about DAS and differential privacy uh, from its microsite, if you will, um, infographics, webinars, videos, blog entries, courses within Census Academy. Uh, so it's always interesting to see uh, what is being repeated back amongst the larger population. Next slide, please. If we look at some of the major reporting, the real highlight has been on the trade-off between accuracy and privacy. Uh, and this is something that is part and parcel of the discussion of differential privacy and disclosure avoidance. That is the usual uh, kind of give and take. Um, all of these, I would say, you know, major news outlets are focusing on questions around accuracy, uh, whether things will be accurate, if they'll be less accurate. And if we move to the next slide, we'll see that some media outlets are explicitly showcasing the potential negative impact in the matter of saying people in homes will vanish, rural America will be erased, that the data will be useless, or will have gross miscounts of, of people of color. So again, as was mentioned earlier before, there's no way the Census Bureau can control what the press is writing and, and what they're uh, you know, reporting on. Um, it can highlight and let them know when there are inaccuracies in what they are reporting. But just to get a flavor of what has been in the general uh, news media around differential privacy. Next slide, please. As part of our delivery, we wanted to share some best practices for communicating to the general audience. One, it's a very complex topic, so opting for non-technical language in the sense plain English is always preferred. And is there a way we can develop a, a word definition, 250 words, which is typically what a person can read and digest in one minute around differential privacy? Using images, pictures and icons, a picture's worth a thousand words, the facility understanding is always recommendable. And it would be interesting to see a standalone document rather than several interdependent documents that build on each other. Since we were able to translate the 2020 census into 59 languages and dialects, we feel it would be appropriate to do the same here as we talk about differential privacy and really pay close attention to crafting culturally appropriate messaging uh, that has been vetted by the actual in-culture experts of the audiences and targets. And again, working with key partners and stakeholders to deliver the message and to be open to feedback. Next slide, please. We really feel there has to be crystal clear messaging around Title 13 and differential privacy. So highlighted on the right in red, I haven't read a Census Bureau document that isn't explicitly clear about Title 13 requirement on privacy and how differential privacy is a tool used to achieve that requirement. But 
once, you know, the game of telephone, once it starts going on to different outlets and people, there's a lot of room for misunderstanding, misinterpretation. And what we've heard anecdotally has been, uh, you know, it, that differential privacy is a legal requirement. So it would be helpful to have crystal clear messaging around exactly what does Title 13 require and how does differential privacy fit into that need. Next slide, please. What our message is requires more effort. So I think we're solid on the Census Bureau communication on differential privacy. We have lots of materials on the website. I think it's also relatively clear on what journalists and researchers, what their differing viewpoints are on differential privacy. But I think it's a big unknown as to the general public's understanding and conception or misconceptions of differential privacy. And as we think about communication, we always think about who is your audience? What do they know? So in order to help clear up this question mark, we suggest that Census Bureau uh, work with their partners and stakeholders to uncover what are the gaps in understanding and are there any misconceptions out there as to what differential privacy is? If there are myths, if there are doubts, then a frequently asked question document, and some already exist in this area, that really help the public grasp what is a very complex topic. There's a need to address head-on census data product accuracy. It's of utmost importance to maintain the confidence and reestablish the confidence in the Census Bureau after their the experience that we've had uh, in the last year and two years. Also, consider explaining how differential privacy is a work in process, not that it's not a, a defined algorithm and that it's undone, but that it's going to be refined over time and over use. So it's going to be getting better and better. And it would behoove the Bureau to really share a canned assessment of the impact of differential privacy on our hard to count populations. And then lastly, reinforcing the value of participating in the census and the accuracy and reliability of data and data products. Last thing we want to do is have give another reason to someone who may be unsure, you know, really wondering why should I participate? Um, they have barriers, they have hesitations. And then if they come away with the feeling that, well, the data is going to be useless anyway, so why should I participate? We, we definitely don't want them to have that impression. Next slide, please. And then once we've defined what that message is, how we deliver the message is crucial. So right now, most of the messaging is falling underneath the owned area, owned media, on the website, in videos, in Census Academy, infographs. We'd like to see it move towards an area where that still is the basis and, and center of information but is there a role for utilizing paid media, earned media, social media, and working with partners and stakeholders to really get more of a 360 holistic uh, surround sound of the messaging? Next slide, please. I'll turn it back here to my colleague, Julio. Yeah. Thank, thank you, John. So, a simple interpretation of a differential privacy that we can find indicates that is the intersection between accuracy on one hand and differential privacy slash noise on the other hand. The most accurate the information provided is the the, the lower the level of protection. On the other hand, the more protected a community is, the less accurate the level of information that will be uh, provided. We have to acknowledge the uh, meaningful effort that is being done by the Census Bureau 
to uh, educate us all on differential privacy. But we find that most of the information available right now is either uh, too technical or complex and uh, need to be uh, explained in plain English. Uh, some of the, or one of the most recent documents that have been released uh, by the census that uh, Explain differential privacy is the disclosure avoidance for the 2020 census a document that was released in November of 2021. A, the, Bureau, the Bureau has indicated that no noise will be injected into a state and local population, but it is likely that the noise will be injected for every other level of a, a, geography. As a result, we have noticed that the process of messaging and communicating differential privacy to the general public may have this explanation about uh, what it is in, let's say, 260 words, perhaps 300 or 500, uh, if it's possible. And at the same time, we strongly believe that it's important to explain clearly how the Census Bureau arrived to the decision of using this differential privacy. And uh, if we can move to the next slide, the technical, the different technological and methodological options that are available. And if we move to the next slide, uh, we, we here try to explain the outreach strategy service. Next slide, please. Yeah, the outreach, the outreach strategies and surveys. When it comes to, to surveys, the U.S. Census Bureau uh, provides surveys, uh, uh, produce an estimate of 130 surveys uh, every year uh, to different federal government agencies. The uh, scope of the application of differential privacy, as it was explained earlier uh, by our colleagues, uh, it hasn't been defined yet with regard to how differential privacy will impact uh, these surveys. And uh, with that, I will, I will uh, tell you that uh, other stakeholders involved include civil rights organizations, tribal communities, uh, organizations like the Congressional Black Caucus, uh, Hispanic Caucus, among others, it can play an important role in the process of supporting the Census Bureau uh, outreach to communicate uh, differential privacy. With that, I will pass the mic to my colleague, uh, John. Thank you, Julio. And if you could advance the next slide, please. Just really to recap, what we tried to highlight today for the Census Bureau are three broad areas with questions that we know the answers exist, but it merits asking them again and really pushing to get answers that can be clear, concise, simple, and plain English for the general public. And these questions are in the areas of process, legal, uh, and in engagement. This concludes our presentation, and we can uh, begin the discussion. Thank you. Uh, this is Shauna Banks. Yeah. Are we turning over to Carol? Yes, this is Jim Tucker. Um, Carol Happer will be up next. Thank <laughs> you. 
Hello, everyone. I hope you can hear me. I just want to um, note that there are gale force winds outside my house, so if um, my internet cuts out, I will be on the phone and ask um, to have the slides advanced. <clears throat> so please bear with me. Um, to begin, I'd like to thank Director Santos and members of the Census Bureau for bringing us together today and providing us the opportunity to um, offer multiple perspectives on your work. Um, I'll be addressing communications and dissemination with the technical and stakeholder community um, and offering some observations based on the review of some of the um, products currently available. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, so in the few minutes that I have, um, just be offering some learnings from the handbook that can inform future communications, um, some key messaging to multiple audiences, um, ways to increase readability, engagement, and utility, and then concluding with um, some discussion questions that can be used to help foster messaging and communications um, to technical audiences and um, to inform the products. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> so um, the Differential Privacy Workgroup was asked to take a look at the handbook um, entitled Disclosure at for the 2020 Census Redistricting Data and Introduction. Um, it consists of, of eight parts, the introduction, um, how does the DAS work, um, what are some recommendations and considerations for using the redistricting data, um, how one might evaluate the data, what are some frequently asked questions, um, some additional resources or glossary are provided along with the technical appendix. And we were asked um, by the Census Bureau SME um, to consider four questions. Is there information missing from this handbook that would be useful? Is there any material that's too technical or confusing? Should any of the content be organized um, or presented differently? And were there any sections of the handbook that um, were particularly useful or any sections that were less useful? And the short answer to these four questions is mostly yes. And I'm going to just go um, through the next um, few slides and present some areas where the messaging could be strengthened and um, ways that this very technical information can be um, presented more simply. Um, next slide, please. So to begin with what the handbook does well and what can be replicated for future products, um, it sets the case very strongly for the use of differential privacy and discussing the, the trade-off between data confidentiality and utility. It also identifies the advantages of using differential privacy as it offers quantifiable and provable confidentiality guarantees. And importantly, it also places this, um, both the dilemma and the, um, and the exercise in historical context. So emphasizing that a confluence of factors, including increased computing power, technical sophistication, data availability um, and all lead to increased threat of re-identification attacks. So um, it puts that message out there clearly. Um, and at the same time, next slide please. It could do a bit more to emphasize some key messages. And first, um, while some of these messages are threaded throughout the document, um, they could be made more explicit. And while the Bureau is known as a data collector, the message could be made more explicit about the Bureau's role um, as a data steward and balancing people's trust in the quality of the data provided while also protecting privacy. That message is buried in some places and it, and it should really be one of the strongest me messages that is conveyed in this product and, and in others. Um, I think this also resonates with, um, oh, please stay here, um, with what Julio and, and John were also saying. Um, and while this document does discuss the advantages of using differential privacy, it doesn't really get into the limitations or 
it does if you take a really close read. And um, it does mention the impact on smaller geographies, but that needs to be made more explicit as well. A, a data user needs to understand both the advantages and the implementations of the methods that they're going to use. And it would be helpful to, um, you know, to provide some guidance about what data users need to know before they start using um, the statistics from um, the data files. So something along the lines of a README document that um, is written in such a way that helps one understand how the data have been manipulated, but then also how it has been made um, useful and where its utility lies. Next slide, please. Um, a couple of other points around prioritizing the message. Um, establishing the need for um, differential privacy, why, why now, why is it needed, um, could really be brought up um, into, you know, the introduction of this product, but then also um, conveyed in other efforts and products as well. In journalistic terms, it's rather like burying the lead. Um, for instance, the section on big data, big potential threats, um, begins on page five, and these two bullet points here about reconstructing 100% of the records with full accuracy is alarming. You know, controlling the rate of influence um, is the problem that the DAS is designed to address. Um, you have to read into the document to really get this message, and, it, and I think this helps balance the, the, the important message to data users and stakeholder communities about um, why, why the urgency, why, why this needs to be done. At the same time, other parts of the um, document, um, and please think of this with um, future products in mind, is thematically organizing the FAQs would be helpful so that it addresses risks and known harms, the use of differential privacy as a protective measure, if you will, um, and then types of data, data um, user engagement and concerns, and then the ability to compare data over time. In its current format, um, these topics are addressed, but they need to be pulled out more to make them more um, readily discernible to um, the end user. And then finally, um, another key point is be intentional about the intended audiences, and that's plural um, because there will be many. Um, but this is presented as an introduction, and it raises the question for whom. Um, and in, there'll be many people that will need this data, that will use it, but people need to see themselves and their concerns in these products. So being intentional about the audience and identifying the appropriate level of proficiency that's needed for this and similar products with, with tiered messaging, just the same way that people get tiered access to data. Um, a helpful blog um, kind of laid out approaches around easy, intermediate, and professional um, users. Um, you know, make things simpler for people that need to know um, from a general sense and to have um, faith in the work of the Census Bureau. You know, provide the hard technical matter for the professional tech um, statisticians, but, but create a continuum of information such that you're able to convey the important message to users in ways that they can understand. And then, um, next slide, please. And find ways to increase readability, engagement, and utility. All of this lends itself to building capacity for both the agency internally, but then also for data users, the general public, stakeholder communities. And it's been said before, but explaining concepts um, in plain and statistical language is really needed. Um, what does epsilon mean? What does noise mean? Take an in other words approach. Provide the statistical language, but then also say, in other words, this is what this means for you, um, general public person. Um, 
In creating documents, use hyperlink text to allow the reader to access definitions in the glossary so that they can move through these documents at their own pace and at their own level of capacity and provide this document and others in an online module format. And within these products, present examples or use cases as exhibits. Um, there's one in the handbook that it's presented as a long passage of text. Um, and a helpful um, resource for this um, is the Differential Privacy of Prima for a Non-Technical Audience um, by Wood, Altman, et al. Um, it's a serious read. It's framed as a primer, but it provides the legal and ethical frameworks, the type of analyses that can be done, practical considerations, and tools for analysis. So it operates more as a toolkit and helps people understand the ways that they can you know, use the data that results from differential privacy. And it's important to make these exhibits both simple to understand while technically accurate and that they're tailored to stakeholder and um, um, the professional community's concerns um, so that there are use cases that speak to the multiple um, stakeholders and really what um, their issues are. And as a way to introduce diversity into these, these products and to take an equity lens, use examples that resonate both with the stakeholder communities but, but use diverse names so that people see themselves um, as diverse racial and ethnic populations. Um, the current product um, uses non-Hispanic white names, and it needs to have more broader use and more broader appeal. Um, it needs to be inclusive. Um, on the right side of the screen here, um, just some suggestions that carry over to, from this product to others. Um, but tell visual stories about the data and differential privacy. Um, as John and Julio mentioned, use infographics um, to you know, clearly, succinctly communicate data concepts, decision rules, and transformation. Um, create interactive data visualization tools to increase user engagement at all level of proficiencies so that you help people understand um, and, and give them the tool that they can work with. And there's currently some places in the handbook that um, this could be done. So for instance, in explaining the trade-off in the privacy budget, um, privacy loss budget, um, you've seen um, in some other resources, you know, where there's a dial used to, um, you know, in, show how that the noise is added and, and how that changes um, the algorithm. Then another example is depicting the invariant statistics for the redistricting data. What's invariant, where has noise been introduced? Show us, show people, um, let it be very clear and let them not have to read through a lot of text to get that. Um, the perfect opportunity for an infographic is to convey how does the top-down algorithm work? It's a series of steps presented as such. Um, it would be very helpful um, for people in, to wrap their heads around that. And then finally, lay out the advantages and limitations in a side-by-side -side so that you both enhance transparency and then can foster public discussion from that um, just so that it's clear and people understand, you know, what the advantages are, what the limitations are, and, and how that affects um, them as a data user, as, as um, a, a group that represents a broader constituency. Um, Next slide, please. And then finally, um, can you go to the next slide? Um, so these here are questions that are open for discussion, but I think can also be used internally. Um, they reflect on what's been done to date and how to move forward. And some reframing may be necessary. So it would be helpful if the Bureau could consider the technical, stakeholder, and general public audience as a broader community of practice of which the Bureau is part, and but taking a leadership role as data steward and convener to um, inform policy decisions and recommendations. And these questions are presented with the utilization focus to compare stakeholder concerns, to identify ways to address them, to document your process and learnings and ultimately co-design the messaging about differential privacy that will, will be shared with the public. 
And it's important that, these, that you critically engage with these questions. And some of this has already been reflected in the communications lessons learned that um, um, you shared with us about the release of the redistricting data um, and with um, Ms. Hollingworth um, addressed previously. And it seems that your framework is around education, teaching, education, and learning, and demonstration and implementation. But this also presented unprecedented statistical and educational challenge and an opportunity for the Bureau to apply community-engaged dissemination and implementation approaches that are culturally grounded, that are used in, in health equity um, research, um, so that you engage in that dialogue, in outreach, in consultation, in increasing involvement, and then ultimately in collaboration and co-design of these products. Um, and I think this is keeping with the equity focus that Director Santos spoke of at the outset and, and in the ways of becoming both community-oriented and critically engaged with the many, many stakeholders of the Census um, Bureau's products. Um, I'll close there now. I thank you for your attention, and I believe we have one minute before we go to the next um, part of our session. So thank you. Thank you, Carol. So this is um, what, what I will go ahead and do is um, we're going to have Flo Gutierrez and Jane Adams in the queue. It looks like we are up to comment periods. So we will back over. All right. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, everyone. So it is now time for public comment. Uh, before we open this forum to the public, I do want to give a few instructions. So written submissions can be sent via the email address on the NAC website. Your written submission should include your name, affiliation, and comment. Once submitted, your written comment will be posted to the MAC website. We are also accepting public comments verbally. Comments are limited to two minutes. Anything over that may be submitted in written form via the email address on the MAC website. Um, and before you begin your verbal comment, we will ask you to state your name and affiliation and then proceed with your comment. So, operator, I'd like to ask if you would please give uh, instructions for how to get into queue to give verbal comments. Absolutely. Uh, if you would like to offer a public comment, please press star 1, unmute your phone, and record your name and affiliation. If you would like to withdraw your comment, you may press star 2. And again, to offer a comment, press star 1, and it could take a moment or two for the comments to start doing that. Okay, thank you very much, operator. While people are getting into queue to offer verbal comments, I will go ahead now and read the three written public comments that are now posted on the MAC meeting page on census.gov. The first written submission comes from G Public, which says, American taxpayers are paying census for fraudulent information collection. We use the census for redistricting. Redistricting sets out districts that should include voters in each district. You should not be including illegal immigrants in census counts as American citizens. They don't belong here. They are illegally living here, and the count you do is used for redistricting to appoint senators and representatives. Wow. For you to use our tax dollars to include illegal immigrants into a census as an indicator of population in an area for setting up districts for voting use the system entirely. When you do a census count, you need to indicate who is an American citizen and who is not. Why have you been skewing and slamming the American population with this skewed count for so many years and doing a clear disservice to the American people? What a sham this agency is to hurt the American voting system this way. Cities are hotbeds of illegals and yet they are counted as all citizens. And then they have more reps in state and federal halls than American citizens do, all because of your shifty, corrupt way of counting. This needs to stop. It needs to stop now. This comment is for the public record. It is fraud on the American people. The next comment comes from Deborah Stein with the Partnership for America's Children. The Partnership for America's Children is very concerned about the implications of differential privacy 
for the accuracy of data on children. We know that the differential privacy algorithm used for the 2020 census redistricting data broke the connection between parents and their children and the data that was released. That resulted in about 160,000 census blocks where the data showed children, the population under age 18, but no adults, the population ages 18 and over. This is highly implausible results. The Census Bureau should communicate with data users about their plans to continue using this algorithm or any other algorithms that also break the connection between children and adults in the household for data files that include family structure and family type, such as the demographic and housing characteristics file, the detailed demographic and housing characteristics file, and data from the American Community Survey. The living arrangements of children are a key to measuring their well-being. For example, the most important single measure of child well-being is the measure of child poverty from the ACS, which must be calculated based on the household income. Census processes that distort the relationships between parents and their children result in inaccurate data on key measures used to understand the lives of America's children. Data users need to understand whether the data they are using maintain or break that relationship. The last comment comes from Joseph Battistelli, who is the Director of Outreach and Membership with the Coalition on Human Needs. The Coalition on Human Needs is an alliance of national organizations representing human service providers, faith groups, civil rights, labor, policy experts, and other advocates working to meet the needs of people with low incomes. CHN has for many years provided training to thousands of people nationwide in the use of census data, including Decennial, Current Population Survey, and American Community Survey findings. The advocates and service providers we provide training to are interested in state and local data, such as the breakdowns for states and localities of child poverty by race and ethnicity. And in the past, we have been able to supply instructions on how to find such data using census ACS tables. We are concerned that tables previously available for states and localities may not be published due to inaccuracies related to differential privacy. To continue providing this guidance to people and organizations, we need to know, as compared to previous years, which tables will be available showing children and families uh, with children by poverty status, race, and ethnicity, including the range of geographic areas for which such data will or will not be available. Can you share a listing of differences in tables available as compared to previous years, or when such a listing will be made available? for these or other breakdowns by age, race, and ethnicity. Thank you, Coalition on Human Needs. Okay, operator, um, that concludes our written comments. Do we have any verbal comments in queue? There are no uh, comments in the queue. Okay. Oh, wait, wait, actually, we had one come in. Give me just a moment. Okay. Once again, written submissions can be sent via email um, to our email address on the NAC website. Your written submission should include your name, affiliation, and comments. Uh, when submitted, your written comments will be posted to the NAC website. Okay, operator, are we okay. ready for our verbal comments? I, I, I am. So I have Dr. Rubidell of the National Congress of American Indians. Your line is open. Thank you. Um, I'm Dr. Yvette Rubin, I direct the Policy Research Center at the National Congress of American Indians. The National Congress of American Indians has submitted 
several letters to the U.S. Census Bureau over the last couple of years expressing our significant concerns about the impact of the 2020 census privacy measures, including differential privacy, on the accuracy and fitness of use for data for American Indians and Alaska Natives, tribal nations, and small rural and remote populations. Meaningful tribal consultation conducted in a manner where the information is understandable to the general public, as has been discussed today, must happen ASAP to ensure that the data for American Indians, Alaska Natives, tribal nations, and other undercounted groups is as accurate as possible. Our analysis of the redistricting data file confirms our concerns that the data is not accurate for many census tribal geographies, especially those that are in small, rural, and remote areas. And this inaccurate data threatens resource allocation, funding formulas, federal, state, and local decision making. We hope that uh, we can have formal tribal consultation um, as soon as possible on this issue. Thank you. Okay, operator, do we have any other verbal comments in queue? There are no comments lined up in queue. Okay, well, thank you very much for uh, the comments. And now we will resume our meeting. So James Tucker will now, um, I should ask James, is there any further discussion needed for the task for deliverable? We just have one, we have one NAC member who will be providing low goods errors. And then after that, we will, we'll be just a few minutes late, but we'll go into our private deliberations fellow. Okay. And so that flow, if you could mute, um, you were up. Great, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Can you please confirm who's speaking, please? Okay, this is Florence Gutierrez from the Annie Case Foundation. Thank you. Sure. Um, so using differential privacy has costs and benefits. Uh, the key benefit of DP is protection of respondents' confidentiality or privacy. Um, and the Bureau has said that it would be transparent about the costs and the benefits of, of this change. So we recommend and we would really like the Bureau to ensure that it's communicating what DP um, about DP, um, like what, what the actual costs are. Uh, right now, we've only been, uh, the focus has really been on one of those costs, which, which is the injection of error into the data. Uh, but we would like um, the Bureau to really be transparent and to really elevate what those costs are and what they're doing to alleviate them. So the five costs that we are highlighting is uh, the injection of error into data, the use of DP. Um, use of DP means that there will be fewer tables available in 2020 census compared to 2010 census. So what are we losing when it comes to, to data? Um, delays in making data from 2020 census available. So availability of data and when it's available is also impacted. Um, discourage responses when potential respondents find out their responses are changed by the Bureau. So what will people do when they realize that error is being infused into responses and their, their data might not be um, entered as, as it, well, represented as it was entered. Um, and then the one that we care about as advocates for children is the fact that DP breaks connections between the child and the adult in the household and what impact that has on our ability to track the well-being of kids and our ability to really um, to measure basic things like child, like the child's um, poverty rate. So in addition to that, we also recommend that the U.S. Census Bureau use an algorithm that maintains the link and relationship between the child and adult in the household. And we would also recommend, the NAC recommends that the Bureau make a clear public statement that the DP algorithm that breaks the link between the child and the adult will not be used uh, for the ACS and the DHC and the DDHC um, and that they use other methods um, that will maintain 
uh, that link, like self-suppression or swapping, uh, to make sure that we have the data that, that we need uh, to continue to measure the well-being of kids and families. Thank you, Flo. And we have one more back discussion from Thomas. Thanks, Jim. Uh, I just want to raise a question. I want to thank my colleagues who, who were the discussants today because I certainly appreciate how uh, complex getting your hands around all of this is. But we did have a, a written public comment about data suppression, which is not DP, but is a part of the new GAS. Uh, it is my understanding that, that there will be a data that previously would have been publicly reported that will be suppressed in order to protect privacy. And I didn't hear any discussion about how that changed in the new DOS would be communicated. And perhaps it's because it's very easy to communicate, but, but if it is a change from prior decades, uh, then, then the data that is now being suppressed for privacy reasons may, may be missed by some folks. So there is an obligation, I think, to communicate on that aspect of it. And, and maybe because it's not technically DP, um, it, it wasn't a part of this, but I, I'm just wondering about that issue raised in the written public comment about uh, additional data suppression in comparison to prior decades and communication about that, if it is the case. Hi, Tom. This is Shawna Banks. That's a question for the Census Bureau, or is that a full committee question to your working group? Uh, thanks, Shawna. I, I think it's both. If there's someone from the Census Bureau who can clarify or, or give that, I, I would appreciate it. Um, I don't know if my, my colleagues who are the discussants uh, uh, may have something to say as well. But. Any working group, this is Shauna Ben. Any working group members have any input to that? Any census bureaus, please? I think we have a census bureau person coming on the line just now. Yeah. Let me just uh, get my camera on. Sorry. Hi, this is Michael Haas. Um, so uh, it's an excellent that's it's an excellent question, and uh, it's one that uh, is challenging to communicate because um, differential privacy doesn't require the suppression of of any data, um, but there are decisions to be made about what the cost of producing. Uh, certain tabulations are in terms of the cost for the overall privacy loss budget and essentially the, the trade-offs uh, of expending privacy loss budget on certain tabulations uh, in terms of less privacy loss budget being available for others. Uh, there's also the question of um, the resulting fitness for use of the data uh, and the question of essentially uh, if you are going to be producing a small uh, like uh, certain tabulations, particularly for small areas that are going to have high levels of noise uh, because they represent very small areas, uh, are those data fit for use, uh, or is it, it would it be better to to suppress them for data quality purposes? Um, so this is part of the stakeholder engagement we've been doing over the last several months. We put out in September, I believe, the uh, proposed. Uh, table crosswalk, uh, the data products crosswalk that showed what tabulations were being planned uh, for the DHC and for the detailed DHC uh, to get feedback from our data users on if there were data needs that would not be met if those were the only tables. And we've received some excellent feedback uh, from that crosswalk. Um, that feedback is being evaluated and um, we're, we're considering what the final set of tables should be based on that feedback. Uh, but we're, we're absolutely looking into that, and, and we will take the committee's recommendation on how we can better communicate that uh, to, to the, the 
to our public stakeholders. Okay, with that, Karen, I'm looking at the time. Um, I, I want to just conclude the discussion. It was a great discussion. Very good presentations by Julio, John, and Carol. And I want to thank Flo and Tom for their questions, as always, for their um, With that, it looks like we have we will be going to a private deliberation. with a separate link all five times, so I will turn over to Yes, so thank you. Uh, James Tucker uh, will now convene the committee offline for the discussion and formulation of the differential privacy recommendations. Uh, the WebEx platform and conference bridge will remain open while the committee engages in deliberation. At 5.15, we will reconvene for the presentation of the NAC differential privacy recommendations. Thank you. Welcome and thanks for standing by. Uh, I would like to go ahead and hand the call off to uh, Karen Battle. Karen, you may begin. All right, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to the NAC Differential Privacy Virtual Meeting. At this time, James Tucker will lead the presentation of the NAC Differential Privacy Recommendations. Take it away, James. Thanks so much, Karen. And just consistent with how we've done this in the past, we will go through um, and vote on a, a five recommendations at a time. Um, I'll just repeat what Shauna had said. I would uh, re request that you keep yourself muted until we actually have a vote on it, and then I'll request. With that, we will 
start, I'm not going to read the comments. I'm just going to read the recommendations. Recommendation 1A, the NAC recommends that in discussing what federal law requires to protect respondent privacy to census surveys, the Census Bureau should state the precise limitations of data dissemination in Title 13, namely that among other legal duties, no census employee or other authorized federal official may, quote, make any publication whereby the data furnished by any particular establishment or individual under this title can be identified, close quote. Recommendation 1B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau avoid messaging that states or implies that application of differential privacy to 2020 census data products is directly required by federal law. Recommendation 1C, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau explain its legal duty to provide accurate data from the 2020 decennial census to the public and in what ways the use of differential privacy facilitates or impedes that duty. Recommendation 2A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau explain why differential privacy was not used before the 2020 census. Recommendation 2B, the NAC recommends that in describing why the Census Bureau selected differential privacy to protect respondent privacy, the Census Bureau explain in language understandable to those who use and are affected by the 2020 census data, that is, in plain language, the other disclosure avoidance methods it considered and how and why it decided to use differential privacy over those other methods. Recommendation three, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau explain why it believes differential privacy is necessary to protect respondent data that is readily available through other publicly available resources, including online searches. Recommendation four, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau release to the public any and all legal opinions or other legal memoranda that support the conclusion that the Disclosure Avoidance System, or DAS, used for the 2010 Census could no longer ensure compliance with the restrictions in Title 13 and or the differential privacy would secure greater compliance than the prior DAS. Recommendation 5A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau's messaging for the general public, that is non-technical readers, be accomplished with the assistance of trained linguists to ensure that the use of plain non-technical language in common usage with a flesh contained readability score of 70 or higher, which is readability at an eighth grade level in plain language, easily understood by those 13 years of age and older. Recommendation 5B, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau provide the general public with a concise explanation of differential privacy in 250 words or less, which is what an average person could read in one minute. Uh, and that is the basic message with a note that followed. Um, recommendation 5C, the NAC recommends that wherever feasible in communications with the general public, the Census Bureau use examples or images to explain its use of differential privacy to facilitate the public's understanding and just to quote what John and Julio presented, a picture is worth a thousand words. Um, with that, I'm going to ask all of the NAC members to unmute themselves. All in favor of recommendations one through five, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, recommendations one through five are adopted. I'd ask NAC members to meet themselves again. Um, recommendation number six, the NAC recommends that messaging to the general public be through a standalone document. That is a single document that could be read without consulting other sources. That includes hyperlinks to definitions, additional documents or detailed explanations if the reader wishes to obtain more information. Recommendation 7A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau translate the basic message into all 59 languages and dialects for which translations were offered during the 2020 decennial census, and the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander languages for which translated language assistance guides were offered during the 2010 decennial census. Recommendation 7B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau provide an audio translation of the basic message into every American Indian Alaska Native language or dialect covered by Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Recommendation 8A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau offer messaging that is culturally appropriate for distinct population groups and not just offer a single uniform message on differential privacy consistent with the mandate in EO or Executive Order 13985. Recommendation 8B, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau work with partners who represent distinct population groups 
to utilize focus groups to provide feedback and propose messaging on differential privacy to those populations, consistent with the mandate in Executive Order 13985. Recommendation 8C, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau create a permanent working group whose membership is open to the public to develop messaging on privacy, including differential privacy, for all census data products that is appropriate to and understandable by all racial and ethnic population groups, consistent with the stated mandate in Executive Order 13985. Recommendation 9A, the NAC recommends that consistent with the government-to-government -government relationship between the federal government and tribal nations, the Census Bureau holds tribal consultations on development of effective messaging for tribal nations. Those tribal nations should focus on allowing tribal representatives and stakeholders to provide feedback to proposed Census Bureau explanations of differential privacy. Recommendation 9B, the NAC recommends that all discussions during tribal consultations must be at an appropriate literacy level for the general public and materials must be sent in advance for tribal leaders and staff to review prior to the consultation to make their participation informed and meaningful. Recommendation 10, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau include privacy, including differential privacy in the Disclosure Avoidance System, or DAS, in its Statistics in Schools, or SIS curriculum. Uh, with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves and then indicate um, by saying aye, all in favor of recommendation. Aye. 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 Um, any opposed? Any abstention? Exact recommendations six through ten are adopted. I'd ask the NAC members to mute themselves again briefly. Um, recommendation eleven: The NAC recommends that the SIS curriculum for privacy, differential privacy, and its DAS be developed in consultation with licensed and trained educators, that is, teachers, to include instruction and hands-on exercises that will allow students to understand both concepts and their impact on publicly available data, such as the interactive online demonstration described in Recommendation 19. Recommendation 12, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's messaging for its SIS curriculum be accomplished using flush concave readability scores appropriate for each grade and age level of participating students. Recommendation 13A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau consult with partners stakeholders, and tribes to identify the most common concerns about differential privacy. Recommendation 13B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau develop a concise response written in plain language that responds to the most common concerns about differential privacy. Recommendation 14, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau answer questions commonly raised about how accurate data can be made available to federal, tribal, state, and local users to ensure that appropriations and funding decisions are not negatively impacted by the Bureau's application of differential privacy to 2020 census data products. Recommendation 15, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau explain in concise and plain language how it will continue to develop and refine its application of differential privacy to future 2020 census and other census data products. Um, and with that, I'm gonna ask the NAC members to unmute themselves and for recommendations 11 through 15, all in favor, indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstention? Okay, NAC recommendations 11 through 15 are adopted. Recommendation um, 15, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau A, provide a candidate assessment of the fact that any method of protecting privacy has on the accuracy of the data the Census Bureau releases. B, describe the impact that previous disclosure avoidance methods used by the Bureau had on the accuracy of the data to which those methods were applied, such as one, it injects errors into the data products. Two, fewer tables are available in the 2020 Census compared to the 2010 Census. Three, application of differential privacy has resulted in delays from 2020 Census data products being made available to the public. And four, the impact that differential privacy has in breaking the connection between children and adults in many responding households. And C, acknowledge and address the trade-offs in applying differential privacy. Recommendation 17, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau's messaging be done in a sensitive manner that encourages and does not discourage 
respondents from completing decennial, annual, and other periodic surveys conducted by the Bureau. Recommendation 18, the NAC recommends that as part of its media to explain differential privacy, the Census Bureau should create a video that is tested with focus groups of diverse members of the general public to determine how much detail and the length needed to, effective, um, to effectively promote an understanding, a basic understanding of differential privacy consistent with the mandate that messaging be appropriate um, to and understandable by all racial and ethnic groups as provided by the mandate in EO 13985. Recommendation 19, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau make its messaging available through a variety of media, including online, print, and through audio, to make it accessible to the widest possible audience consistent with the stated mandate in Executive Order 13985. And then recommendation 20, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau create interactive online demonstrations that facilitate the general public's understanding of A, the trade-off between privacy and accuracy, B, how that trade-off occurs under differential privacy, and C, a case study showing how adding more noise impacts the accuracy of data. The interactive demonstrations should be tested to ensure that they are easy to use, fun, and effectively communicate to diverse audiences as provided by Executive Order 13985 to show how the Census Bureau uses its disclosure avoidance systems, or DAFs, such as differential privacy to strive for providing data as accurate as possible while, while protecting respondent privacy. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. And for recommendations uh, 20, they indicate by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? And then um, recommendations 16 through 20 are adopted. Recommendation 21A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau issue a detailed report of its outreach, consultations, and public notice and comment on proposed application of differential privacy to each of the 2020 census data products, including the number of responses received by respondent categories, such as academics, federal agencies, state government, local government, private NGOs, individuals, et cetera. Recommendation 21B, the NAC recommends that in the detailed report recommended above, the Census Bureau identify all priority use studies that it received by priority use categories, such as redistricting, appropriations, housing, research, et cetera. Recommendation 21C, the NAC recommends that in the detailed report recommended above, the Census Bureau explain how it used the priority use studies received during each notice and comment period to adjust the algorithm and privacy loss budget to develop for each 2020 census data product. Recommendation 21D, the NAC recommends that in the detailed report recommended above, the Census Bureau provide a complete history of all algorithms, demonstration data sets, and privacy loss budgets considered in its development and application of differential privacy to 2020 census data products consistent with reasonable limitations on the specific information that is provided. Recommendation 22, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau release a summary of its engagement with federal agencies on the potential impact of differential privacy on federal funding formulas, what solutions were developed to ensure the most accurate data for tribal, small, rural, and remote populations, and indicate which federal agency formulas use decennial census data versus American Community Survey versus population estimates data. Recommendation 23A, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau provide sub-state metrics and alternative sources of data to allow communities to understand the impact of differential privacy on the accuracy of data available to those communities. Recommendation 23B, the NAC recommends that if the Census Bureau is limited in the sub-state metrics and alternative sources of data it can provide about the impact of differential privacy on data accuracy, then the Census Bureau should solicit from stakeholders what types of metrics they would like to see at a sub-state level so that the Bureau can provide alternatives or summary metrics to meet those needs. Recommendation 24, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau develop a publicly available lessons learned summary of what it learned during the consultation and notice and comment process and how those lessons can be applied to future applications of differential privacy to future census data products. And then recommendation 25, the NAC recommends 
Census Bureau enter into special data use agreement with researchers interested in evaluating and writing research papers be published on the Bureau's application of differential privacy to 2020 census data products. And with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. Um, and then for recommendations 21 through 25, I'll ask all those to indicate their agreement by saying aye. 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 Any opposed, say nay. And any abstentions? NAC recommendations 21 through 25 are adopted. Recommendation 26. We are now getting to the home speech. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau publicly release detailed information about presentations, analysis, deliberations, and conclusions reached by members of the Data Stewardship Executive Policy Committee or DSEP Committee about application of differential privacy to 2020 census data products. Recommendation 27A. The NAC recommends that the Census Bureau publish different versions of the handbook to match the technical expertise and interest of each reader group, such as following a model proposed by a commentator with, with the link provided that identifies three audiences, easy, intermediate, and professional, and provides a discussion that matches the level of proficiency of that audience. Recommendation 27B, the NAC recommends that um, the Census Bureau identify the intended audience for each communication or publication. For example, quote, this introduction to differential privacy is intended to educate a non-technical user. Recommendation 28, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau continue to replicate the discussion on the following topics from the handbook in its future communications. A, an explanation of how differential privacy balances privacy and accuracy. B, the advantages of using differential privacy over other methods of disclosure avoidance. And C, explaining differential privacy in the context of computer power and technical sophistication as part of the increased threat of re-identification attacks. Recommendation 29, the NAC recommends that in the interest of full transparency in its future communications and publications, the Bureau describe A, how and why the Bureau described, decided to use differential privacy over other disclosure avoidance methods, B, the limitations of differential privacy, C, the impact of differential privacy on priority uses identified by data users and stakeholders, and D, concerns that block level data may be too noisy compared to, to more populated areas in which data accuracy is improved while the frequency of improbable and impossible results is substantially reduced. Um, actually, I should just correct this. It should be too noisy compared to um, too noisy. Um, oh no, I'm sorry. It, it is correct. <laughs> I just had to reread it. Uh, recommendation 30A. The NAC recommends the Census Bureau establish the need for and provide the rationale for differential privacy early in its communications and publications. In particular, near the beginning, the Bureau should explain why it has decided to use differential privacy for the first time in its release of 2020 census data products, and why it began the process of constructing its top-down algorithm so late in the planning process for the 2020 census. Recommendation 30B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau thematically organize frequently asked questions or FAQs to address, among other topics, risk and known harms, why differential privacy is being used for the first time in the 2020 census data products, Use of differential privacy to balance data privacy, data privacy with its utility, the Bureau's stakeholder and data user engagement and the concerns they raised, and comparing the need to protect privacy and data over time, such as a comparison between the 2010 and 2020 decennial census. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves. And um, looking at recommendations 26 through 30, please indicate your assent to those by stating aye. 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 Uh, Aye. Any opposed? Say nay. And any abstentions? Okay. NAC recommendations 26 through 30 are adopted. I believe we're in the last set of five. Um, recommendation 31A, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau explain key concepts in the glossary in plain and statistical language, including, quote, differential, close quote, epsilon, noise, and privacy loss budget. Recommendation 31B, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau use hyperlinked text of key terms to 
allow readers who do not understand those terms to access definitions of the glossary without distracting more technical readers who do not need those ex explanations. Recommendation 31C, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau present examples or use studies exhibit as exhibits in its publications and not as long passages in the main body of the publications and make those examples easier for the general public to understand. Recommendation 31D, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau be more equity focused in the examples it uses and appeal to a more racially and ethnically diverse audience um, as required by Executive Order 13985, such as not using only names that readers identify as likely being non-Hispanic white people, such as Bob and Ellis. Recommendation 31E, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau use more infographics to clearly and succinctly communicate data concepts, decision rules, and other core ideas, such as figure 2.1 in the handbook, which is creating differentially private data for the 2020 census redistricting files. Topics for which infographics should be developed include explaining the trade-off in the privacy loss budget and how it is set, depicting the invariant statistics for the 2020 census redistricting data and where noise has been introduced, and depicting how the top-down algorithm works. Recommendation 32, NAC recommends the Census Bureau provide greater emphasis on its data stewardship, the development and use of the top-down algorithm, and limitations of differential privacy, including its impact on more sparsely populated areas and smaller geographies. Recommendation 33, the NAC recommends the Census Bureau commit to maintaining a list of all circumstances brought to its attention where newly suppressed data limited the ability to comply with state or federal law and that the Bureau can further commit to a public assessment of each such circumstance, including what has been done or could be done to ameliorate this consequence of additional data suppression. Recommendation 34, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau through the Department of Commerce request sufficient appropriations to ensure resources are available to implement the NAC's recommendations on messaging privacy, including differential privacy in the DAS. Recommendation 35, the NAC recommends that the Census Bureau use an algorithm that, that maintains the link relationship between the child and adults and households. And then finally, recommendation 36. The NAC recommends that the Bureau make a clear public statement that the differential privacy algorithm that breaks the link between children and adults will not be used for the ACS and the DHC slash uh, DHC. Um, and with that, I'm going to ask the NAC members to unmute themselves one last time. And all in case. Hi. 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 Any A? And any abstention? With that, NAC recommendations 31 through 36 are adopted. Um, I want to thank. Um, all of the NAC members for their time and efforts in going through and preparing. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Karen. All right. Well, thank you, James. And I also would like to thank the NAC members, uh, as well as census leadership and staff for participating in today's meeting. Uh, this actually concludes the NAC Differential Privacy Virtual Meeting Proceedings. So I wanted to let everybody know that the next NAC meeting will take place on May 5 and 6. So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for participating. Have a good evening. The meeting is now adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye. Second, please, today's call. Thank you for participating. You may disconnect at this time.